Welcome to Skywatch. My name is Jim Elise, and I'd like to introduce my co-host for today, Ashley Adams. Ashley lives in Burlington, and she owns an industrial manufacturing business right near the end of the runway at Burlington International Airport. I'd also like to introduce our guest for today's show, Emma Mulvaney Stanek. She's, an, she's a mom with two kids, and she's also a business owner. She's the wife of a Burlington City employee and is a former Burlington City Councilor. She spent years as a labor organizer and a community organizer, and she's currently a member of the, Mont, the, the Vermont State Legislature, representing the Old North End and the New North End, parts of Burlington. Plus, she is the nominee of the Burlington Progressive Party to be its candidate for mayor of Burlington. Emma, I am so excited to sit down and talk with you today, especially given how busy I know you are right now. And I'm wondering if we could start um, by just hearing a little bit from you about what your top priorities are for the city, should you become mayor. Well, thanks, Ashley, and thanks, Jimmy, for having me on. I think Public Access TV is a great way to get information out um, as well as about campaigns. So I appreciate the invitation. Uh, so, so briefly, just why I'm running and then how that informs sort of the three big areas that I think are important for Burlington to focus on. So I'm running because I am a mom. I'm a mom of two small kids, and I have a deep love of Burlington and this city. And I'm deeply concerned about what's been going on in our streets and in our neighborhoods and even within city government over the last few years. Um, I've, as uh, Jimmy mentioned, I've been serving in the Vermont legislature, so doing policy work uh, on the state level. But every time I come back to Burlington at night um, when this, we're in session, I, I don't see the kind of um, functional government, the kind of collaborative government, um, the government that kind of values making sure that it functions and solves problems together um, that I am akin to at the State House. And so it really felt important with the mayoral um, uh, election coming up that there be another option on the table, one where um, at least has a leadership style, which I believe I do, one based on collaboration, deep listening in the community, and then also centering community and people and how we solve problems. And that's not only making sure that we realize the folks who, uh, and I'll get into this in the three areas that I'm focusing on, that the people who are suffering on our streets are seen as the Vermonters that they are, but also that we bring um, public health experts and community safety experts um, and climate experts to the table to really be solving um, our problems uh, and challenges together with city staff and with community members. Um, so a lot of people ask me why in the world I would run and I'm running because I have this deep love of Burlington and I want to see it vibrant and a, um, a safe community not only for my kids but for everyone who lives and visits here. My three big policy areas are community safety, which I use very purposefully because uh, it's bigger than pub just public safety and police. It is a much more, uh, we need a much more holistic response to really understanding what is making our, our community feel and, and actually be unsafe for some folks. Uh, the second area is affordability, which I really hope as this campaign gets going, this election gets going, there's more attention to that as well because we are in a deep, um, similar crisis or another crisis around affordability. And then the third one is uh, livability, and that's a combination of making sure we have a safe community that is inclusive and, and a place where people feel they truly belong, as well as a healthy planet. So climate is another part of livability, so really paying attention to the city's um, piece of solving our, our climate challenges um, as we look at all the different pieces that the city interfaces with. That's great. It, it's really, um, I love hearing you talk about um, safety from a holistic standpoint. And I think about um, the mayor's job as, as you know, really being in charge of health and safety of the population. I'm wondering if you see the 115 decibel F35 training um, in a densely populated area as a health and safety issue and, and kind of if you'd like to speak to that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not only a health and safety issue, it's also, <coughs> I think, a question of where are our values um, as a community because F-35s not only with the noise impact and the health impact, 
there is a symbolism of having um, these war machines, to be perfectly honest, stationed in our community. And so, um, and it also, I think, it begs the question, and maybe we'll get into this as well, around what kind of jobs are we um, valuing in our communities? And let's make sure people have access to good paying, livable wage jobs, but they don't have to necessarily be attached to um, the military uh, and the military industrial complex, which is supporting in this particular uh, mission, um, a, a machine that is essentially about war and destruction. Um, but to public health, uh, I just need to say that because my parents are peace, peaceniks, activists, and, uh, and I've been raised with the, that value base of um, part of the choices we make um, re are a reflection of our values. And if we want a peaceful community which adds to safety, we have to have a deeper analysis of the other kinds of decisions we're making of how much money we invest in the military, et cetera. So that aside, um, I, you know, as a mom of two small kids, the F-35s just personally, I, we lived in Winooski briefly, um, in, even before we had kids, it's very unlivable. It's just plain unlivable for people to be living in the flight paths of these machines. Um, and even the, and I would very much emphasize minor tweaks that have happened around um, the, uh, oh, what's the technical term, the, the, the afterburn or whatever it is to like launch those planes faster that, that creates even more um, impact of noise. That's not good enough in terms of the, um, the, the just the auditory um, safety and, and public health of folks. The trauma that um, it also brings in when we know that our population, as it continues to diversify with immigrants and refugees, some of which are coming from war torn, war -torn areas, um, it has a ripple effect on trauma. And we've already been traumatized enough during COVID to really now get to the point of understanding how what do we have within our control to, um, to minimize continued trauma and continued traumatization of, of our population. We have to be reconsidering this. This is not the only way it has to be, but it also requires imagination um, and creativity from leadership in our community and state to think about, okay, what are the other options and how do we get there? That's great. I really appreciate hearing you talk about um, talk about this. And I, you know, I see the F-35 really as um, an environmental justice issue. And I think about how with uh, environmental justice issues, those who are most impacted are the least able to um, advocate for themselves, particularly children. And I wonder, given that as mayor of Burlington and with um, hopefully mayor of Burlington, um, as the airport proprietor, Burlington really is in a greater position of power to do something and to elevate those voices and actually do something about that powerlessness. Um, how, do you, how do you see your role as um, mayor in terms of advocating for those who are most affected? Mm -hmm. Well, one big role of the of the mayor of any public a public you know government and community is to really think about um, what is the benefit to community, what is the obligation to community here, and so with any any big partnership or lease or um, project that happens um, with any entity, in this case the National Guard um, through the airport and the city, or even with um, private pu public partnerships, because there's a lot that are going to be coming down the pike with how the city looks at these other big questions like the gateway block and whatnot. This is an opportunity to ask the question of um, how can we best benefit the community? How do we look at what our common goals are around public health in this case, around environment, around climate? There's a climate impact with these um, large um, planes and their carbon input uh, impact on the environment. How do we align all those things and not just forget about them because of uh, oversimplifying, we just have to support the guard and, and jobs. Yes, we have to support good jobs and there are other options out there. Um, I've actually met with um, the National Guard just to, this is my style, I wanna learn more about when the airport lease went through so quickly, I wanted to learn a little bit more about why was that the case? And there are options, there are alternatives, um, ways to do trainings, alternative ways um, and, there, and this mission may not even be for that much longer anyway, but regardless, there are clearly other ways we can be using the Guard and doing trainings that are um, virtual, uh, just other kinds of missions that don't involve the F-35. So the fact that, that that is a different answer than even when I heard when we first were talking about F-35s a few years ago. Um, so it shows that through evolution and I think some, uh, not evolution, but through um, both time, but also really thinking creatively about other options, there all are, are alternatives out there. And it's not a zero sum, either you're with us or against us. There's, with some creativity, we can find better a better right size fit for Burlington that aligns again with our values of health and, and hopefully peace um, and good jobs for Vermonters. 
Yeah, I think there really is a false narrative around, you know, F-35 goes away, the guard goes away. It's simply, simply not the case. No, that's not. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's not just the noise itself. There's also the impact of noise on one of the things you mentioned that you're very concerned about, which is affordability. Yes. There's the 44 acres of land that's now vacant of housing, which was demolished mm -hmm. by the city using FAA grants, and the city bought over uh, about 200 houses, mm -hmm. demolished them because of military jet noise back in 2015. Mm -hmm. And that land is still vacant. Um, but the FAA grant assurances that the city had to sign to get those grants require the city to restore housing mm -hmm. on that land once the military jets go away, once the noise mm -hmm. from the airport goes away. Mm -hmm. And that noise is totally because of, the F, of these F-35 jets. Mm -hmm. So if they're, if they're removed, if they're stopped training here at this airport, mm -hmm. then that 44 acres becomes available. And since it's city owned, the city can put a huge amount of affordable housing mm -hmm. and really solve the um, housing problem. Mm -hmm. a 40, I mean, there's just three acres for a city place. Mm -hmm. He has 44 acres. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? Isn't that a real driver for any political, anyone aspiring to political office? Wouldn't you think everyone who's running should be mm -hmm. on board to stop the F-35 training mm -hmm. and, and how will you, how will you, what do you think about yeah. this 44 acre issue? Well, it goes back to kind of being really clear eyed about what our, our needs are as well as our values. And clearly we're not even in a housing crisis anymore. We're in a housing emergency. We have not kept up as a state, let alone locally in Chittenden County, with building enough actual houses. So even if you were working with someone um, to get them from being unhoused on the streets to finding actual housing, there is not a unit to put them in right now. So uh, we're, we're in this emergency state and so Times change, right? 2015 to 2023, we now have such a need for housing that should be a major decision point um, that gets considered about whether the F-35s are um, a barrier for us to put up more housing, for example. And the fact that we do have this open land and this access um, and um, such a critical need for new housing to be actually physically built, it does seem like a time to start to shift our priorities. Um, I also think that, uh, you know, the, you're right, the fact that this is city-owned uh, land uh, really is a um, advantage point in terms of this, again, community benefit analysis of when, how are we leveraging our assets in the most smart way. Um, and overlaying that on top of it, uh, because I, probably the zoning is related to South Burlington zoning, for example, we now have just passed a law uh, on the state legislature level, on the, uh, on the state level, that is requiring upzoning. It's a it's a, it's a technical term, but basically requiring more units to be built per lot, if you will, uh, than a single family household, because we know we're at such a critical need, we need more dense housing. And that it all makes sense in terms of the city of South Burlington um, and really leveraging all these different changes that have happened since 2015. I think good leaders know that you have to continue to adapt and have flexibility and that times and needs of communities change over time. Um, and what may have served us back in 2015 may not be serving us now because of um, acute needs that we now are facing in our in our city. Yes, that's absolutely right about the density of housing, especially. Uh, I think South Burlington has has upped the density al uh, allowed in that area, mm -hmm. and in the in the downtown. It's very close to downtown. It's very close to transportation. It's the ideal place. It's mm -hmm. close to stores. It's close to the uh, Chamberlain School. Mm -hmm. This is a perfect area for housing and it's and it's uh, it's an area of starter homes it's an area of affordable housing and it's so valuable to get that land back into housing mm -hmm. one other thing that's very valuable for abolishing the F35 training at the airport is the fact that the military's own regulations their own discipline prohibits hurting civilians, prohibits making civilians a target mm -hmm. of their military operations. And here we have children being the victims. We had Dr. Bingham on the show, the chief of uh, pediatric neurology at the UVM Medical Center, who talked about the various ways that the, the children's mental 
and physical development, their hearing, and, but not just their hearing, they're also their cognitive development and their all kinds of uh, issues, medical issues uh, arise because of ex repeated exposure to the noise at that level. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's increasing awareness of uh, noise being a factor for dementia. For it, it's like heart disease and stroke and other things. So anyway, the military's own regulations prohibit hurting civilians. They call it distinction. You're supposed to keep your military operations separate and apart mm -hmm. from populated areas. Mm -hmm. That's in the Law of War manual put out by the Defense Department. And the Department of Defense has directive it's called 2311.01 .01 for the audience. If you want to look it up, it says that for the United States, the law of war is applied not just during combat operations, but in all circumstances. Any, anywhere that the military is operating, they're supposed to be uh, enforcing mm -hmm. that directive. Mm -hmm. So here we have something that if, if if the city government said to the guard, look, enforce your own regulation, mm -hmm. what are they going to say? How are they going to oppose that? Mm -hmm. I think there's some, and I think as mayor, well, what do you think? Would you be willing to tell the guard to look at your own regulation? Let's have a discussion about this mm -hmm. in public. Mm -hmm. What would you do? Well, part of, uh, well, I was a former labor and community organizer for most of my uh, professional career, and I will tell you that um, how we, uh, the best ways of um, tackling tricky and thorny issues is really to start building relationships so we can get to a, a place, and it's not adversarial, but we can get to a place where there's common ground and understanding about the why. Um, and, you know, I, as I mentioned, I met with the guard briefly, and the, I feel like their leadership has that openness, and I think we have to continue to develop that relationship in a way that, um, that's clear about reflecting the full community. And I mean that not just Burlington, but Winooski and South Burlington. There are other impacted communities here. Uh, and my style of leadership is one that's really open-handed in the sense of it is not just sort of an exceptionalism of Burlington only, but really what is our collective need um, as, as a larger, wider community here. Uh, and making sure that we're leveraging the fact that Burlington owns the airport um, as uh, and stewarding that forward um, in a really responsible way that reflects the benefit of this larger sense of community. Um, but I would start with building those relationships so we could get to a place where, um, not not for the sake of just ever not ever ask calling the question, if you will, but getting to a place where there can be invitation for creatively thinking. Like what? Okay, our common goal. I'm sure it would be having good jobs, supporting the guard and the Vermonters who are employed there. Um, making sure our, our communities are safe and healthy and are what is being offered right now the right, right way of getting there or is it causing harm and to be able to have those kind of honest um, um, questions and then leveraging um, the city's role. Uh, we do have, I think Jimmy was saying before we came on, uh, we have a referendum where this Burlington voters weighed in on F-35. So it's an obligation to listen to residents and I would imagine if that question were called again to voters, it would probably be even a higher margin than the 55% or so as I recall because the longer you live under the, um, the noise of these planes, the longer that you live kind of in this uh, constant state of uh, reminder of these war planes, it, ch it really has a long-term impact. And I think people are um, experiencing it very differently than when it first, first um, started flying in our skies. Right. Yes. I, I really agree. I think that uh, developing good relationship mm -hmm. with the Guard is fundamental. Mm -hmm. I want to get back to um, you touched on climate um, briefly earlier, Emma, and I know uh, that climate is an important part of your platform. Mm -hmm. Given that F-35s burn uh, 22 gallons of jet fuel per minute of flight, and given that there are thousands of um, hours of flight every year, I'm wondering how you see that, um, the, cl the really climate catastrophe that is the F-35 in this community, how you see climate um, impacting um, you know, what we ought to do about mm -hmm. the F-35. Mm -hmm. Well, one of, my, one of my personal core values is consistency. And I think if we're talking about, uh, as a state and as uh, probably the city as well, supporting in innovative things around um, airplanes such as beta's technology of electric planes, et cetera, and trying to minimize you know, car emissions in other places around individual uh, use of cars and transportation, we have to be consistent about all aspects um, that are facing our community, and that includes F-35s. It's very odd to me that there isn't a climate um, 
a climate uh, overlay or frame or just way of thinking around the impacts of F-35s on climate if we're trying to be climate champions in all other spaces except for this. Uh, and you know, and also looking at our airport, our airport itself is has climate standards. They're about to build. A, I was just meeting with the um, director yesterday. We're doing a renovation on the north part of the terminal, um, but it's all with geothermal wells and all these other kind of standards, which is great. And it's 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 very odd to not be applying those same standards and asking those same questions of, as you said, these these planes that single handedly put out so much pollution into our system. And so consistency is important. It is, it is a very, um, I think, um, thoughtful and um, expected and reasonable way to be asking, how do we kind of reconsider things in our community, knowing that our collective goal is here is to really do our part to mitigate our impact on the climate. Yeah, I think um, consistency sort of um, trumps or overturns hypocrisy. <laughs> <laughs> It's like an antidote to hypocrisy. Sure. Yes. No, it is. It, that, that, that word uh, definitely is, is ap applicable because uh, the current administration makes such a big point about its, mm -hmm. about its uh, climate goals, mm -hmm. but in actuality with the McNeil plant uh, emitting enormous amounts of carbon dioxide and the F-35s mm -hmm. emitting, there's nothing that uh, this administration is really, uh, the minor tiny little things uh, ju are just performative and mm -hmm. Uh, lipstick on a pig compared to these the F-35 and the McNeil plant. Mm -hmm. One other thing that it, it struck me, and I've been I've been learning about this F-35 issue over the years, and one of the most recent things I've learned is the how the FAA has been working since the 1970s mm -hmm. to reduce the noise of aircraft, of civilian aircraft. Mm -hmm. And they've rec they recognized way back then that noise, that people living around the runways at all the different airports, whether it was in Chicago or Los Angeles or New York or anywhere mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the country or in the world, mm -hmm. who's living in that noise zone or near the runway is really getting hammered. And there are so many studies that show that. There's a German study that showed that when the airport moved, the test scores of children in the schools went back up. Mm -hmm. And then to the location where the airport moved to, the test scores of the children went down. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so a whole new generation of kids was saved because the airport moved. And a whole generation of children at the new airport was, was, was hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a lifelong impairment. Now there's, I mean, this is, this is really, so the FAA really understands, and now they're at the fifth level of reduction of noise from civilian aircraft. In fact, um, there's, if you look at the FAA website, they say that there were close to 10 million people living in these areas around runways, like, mm -hmm. like the Chamberlain neighborhood here in, in South Burlington or you know, the Winooski area where you used to live. Mm -hmm. and. Um, now the number of people living in, of, in those same noise areas is reduced by 90, over 90%, maybe 95%. So it's less than 1 million still living there. But here in Burlington, just the opposite happened. We've had an increase in the number of people living in a noise zone. And it's because of one aircraft, the F-35. And that's an aircraft the FAA does not regulate. It doesn't have authority to regulate military aircraft. The FAA's website says they can only regulate the noise of civilian aircraft. And they've done a great job with that since the 1970s. But what the FAA does say is that the airport owners have the authority. The individual airport owners, mm -hmm. there's nothing restricting them from setting the same safety standard that the FAA sets. Mm -hmm. And that wouldn't affect any of the civilian aircraft because they're already under the FAA rule. Mm -hmm. It would affect anyone who's not regulated by the FAA, including military aircraft. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is, some, this is a power the city of Burlington has mm -hmm. and, and it, could, it could use it. Mm -hmm. um, if, in fact, the FAA is so interested in local airports using this authority that they include it in the 
grant assurances. So like, for example, the Burlington Airport gets tens of millions of dollars in grants. And every time they have to sign the grant assurance that how, how they will operate. And there's 22 different provisions. Mm -hmm. And among them are the provision that the city, that the city owned airport, that the city can set regulations for safety mm -hmm so long as they apply to all aircraft. There's no discrimination. You can't just pick out one or another. Mm -hmm. and, if, and so it has to be blanketly applied. And, but we have one aircraft that stands out, violating the noise and hurting the people mm -hmm. who live in the area around mm -hmm. that airport. It's about two miles from each end of the runway okay. yeah. and about a half mile from the sides of the runway is the oval okay. area. But we have the, air, the, the, air, the U.S. Air Force in its environmental impact statement said that 6,663 people live mm -hmm. in that oval mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at our airport. Mm -hmm. So why, and, and of course there's 100,000 or 120,000 in Shittenden County. It's such a small minority mm -hmm. that they, like Ashley was saying, they're low-income minority populations, and they don't have the vo and they don't have the impact. Mm -hmm. People living in near where I live in the southeast quadrant, uh, it's annoying. Mm -hmm. It's loud. It interrupts Zoom meetings, but it doesn't hurt their children. Mm -hmm. But this is a severe impact on the children, and there are about 1,300 children living there. Mm -hmm. So here is the opportunity for the city to use an authority that. The FAA itself says the city has. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what do you think? Is it, I mean, if the discussions, and I think the yeah. first step, what you're talking about, is the most valuable, mm -hmm. the relationship mm -hmm. with the commanders. Mm -hmm. And I think commanders want to enforce their own discipline. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I think it was a certain, certain political, statewide political leaders who foisted the F-35 mm -hmm, here. Mm -hmm. But now I think so, one of them is gone, and it's time for reconsideration. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I think the relationship would work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if it doesn't, what do you think about starting to talk about using the city's authority and yeah. implementing that yeah. if necessary? Yeah. Well, there's a lot in there, <laughs> Jimmy. And I think the, uh, so, so among other things, relationships, yes, our, our congressional delegation has shifted just in the last um, year or so. So it's about also establishing, making um, sure those relationships are strong right. um, and can be relied upon and that we're all pushing in the same direction. Um, I would extend that to also the governor and um, state uh, legislative leaders as well so that we all, again, understand what collectively these communities mean. And, and I do appreciate um, Ashley's point around the disparities because I think that's another very important piece to continue to name um, because the, uh, very much the, the neighborhoods right around Burlington National, uh, Burlington, National <laughs> Burlington Regional Airport um, are working class families, are, and especially look at Winooski and the Old North End um, in particular, um, are folks who are mostly black and brown families um, there um, compared to other places and so those communities tend to have less political voice because they have less ability to kind of engage in, in the political process. And so it's important that um, we make sure that we um, approach things from an equitable place where we are listening to and thinking of the needs of those populations as much as the folks who can regularly show up at the meetings in the middle of a work day or have the relationships um, for other reasons to, with a direct line to um, policymakers and leaders. Um, so that's a, another kind of, again, values-based kind of leadership where we are thinking about where is our disparate impact <coughs> and where can we thinking about our policy work and, the, and <coughs> excuse me, a more equitable approach for understanding kind of our obligation to community. Um, and I think, yes, I mean, ultimately, I hope that because I think it just makes for longer, more sustained policy change when we can collectively get there as a community. And sometimes it takes political courage to put questions forward. It would, uh, the mayor has to work with the city council. I think that's a, um, a general observation I've had. Again, why I'm running for mayor is that relationship is pretty frayed. Uh, relationships within council are frayed, and we need to collectively work on ourselves to make sure we're a highly functional um, group of leaders uh, so we can, again, put... Um, put policy forward that uh, reflects uh, the needs of our community um, and again, push in that same direction. And when necessary, I think a mayor, because it is a um, um, mayor strong uh, form of government, needs to put ideas on the table um, that sometimes are um, bolder so that we can actually start the conversation. And, and another world is possible. We've heard this phrase, right? But another world is possible. And that's the, um, the value of this mayor strong system where 
you know, the folks who are on council are very part time, right? Like putting out what else is possible in terms of other alternative missions for the for the guard. What is what is or isn't currently. Um, the position of our federal delegation and our state delegation, what are these um, larger tools and, le and uh, levers that we have to pull, including what you've educated me today about the FAA and getting, again, consistent and in alignment with um, standards that our federal government has been pushing for decades, it sounds like, right. um, to be in line with better um, public health standards um, and, and better and deeper understanding of the disparate impact on community. So I think that's, that's the work ahead. Right. So, um, Ashley, do you want to, do you have any other questions or I, thoughts you, know, you want to share? Not questions so much as I really appreciate hearing um, you talk, Emma, about el kind of elevating the, um, the needs of the community that is not being heard. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the idea um, of the folks really who feel powerless and helpless mm -hmm. um, to do anything about the F-35s. And, and you know, I think what I agree that what we're lacking right now is a vision um, from the mayor that really elevates those voices. And I think mm -hmm. the mayor of Burlington can use um, the, well, really the bully pulpit um, and, and put forward a vision that does recognize the needs of these human beings that mm -hmm. are, are being ignored. It's, it's really, mm -hmm. Um, appreciate hearing that from you. Yes. You know, there was a senior policymaker in um, Montpelier who told me once that policies and laws are made by people. They can be undone or redone by people. I mean, there's nothing that is actually permanent when you think about it. What's, what complicates it are power dynamics, right? And, and also making sure that um, we have uh, elected leaders who are accountable to their communities, but also, again, have that, that, um, that framework of understanding that relationships really do truly matter, and that is how we make strong policy that lasts and doesn't just change with every political cycle of this mayor in, this mayor out. And so I want to put forward um, policies that make our community safer and healthier, but can be sustained both fiscally but also policy-wise. So people, there's a, there is a, um, a buy-in that happens within our community that people, uh, at least the majority of people, can really believe in and then sustain that going forward. Right. Well, I think we're running out of time. But I'd really like to thank you for, for coming on the show, Emma mm -hmm. and, and Ashley. And um, I think this has been a really valuable discussion. And it's really great to know that we have such a strong candidate, such an articulate candidate, and such an uh, understanding and able candidate running for mayor. And thank you very much. Thank you both. Thank you, Emma. Yeah. Really enjoyable.